The next thing I really want to talk about in popular culture is popular music. And this is something where we're all a little bit expert in our own genres of popular music and our own um, preferred performers and um, different ways that we just completely like penetrate and understand these things because many of us have really gotten into one thing or another and done deep dives and we all have our preferences and I, I want to stress that nowhere in here am I trying to make artistic evaluations uh, and nowhere in here am I trying to um, support the superiority of one genre of music over another or anything like that. For the most part, I want to take a musicologist sort of view of music and I want to try and get you to stretch your ideas of what popular music is and what it means to the culture and to question a lot of these different things as they relate to the evolution of human history. That may sound like a little bit of a stretch, but I really feel like it's important to take a look at the development of music as it has paralleled the development of art and the development of the sciences that it has those same sorts of stages where you can hear a piece of music and place it within, you know, 50 years or 20 years if you're really good. Um, I mean, obviously, if you're really good, you can nail the year. And to recognize that the phenomenon of popular music is actually pretty new. And to look at the way the music industry has changed it, has repackaged things, and has directed some of our thoughts about ourselves through their tools. There has been no music in throughout history as influential as the American music scene these days. And it's not because it's necessarily a superior form of music or anything like that. It's because the cultural influences are vast and that it can be heard anywhere around the world. Um, the different aspects of American music history are absolutely fascinating. There, there may be nothing that shows the cultural influences on uh, this country and culture as well as music does. And maybe I'm absolutely out of my mind, uh, but that's how it generally plays out. Like, there are two musical instruments throughout history that have been invented in the United States. Only two. And I'll ask you to guess them. And for the most part, one of them you just won't get. And the other one you totally will. And the thing is, is that the dichotomy of these two instruments really points to the dichotomy of musical development in this country. And that is, the first musical instrument that we're, we think of in the United States as being invented here is the glass harmonica. This is not an instrument that you're likely familiar with unless you're a music nerd. And it was invented by Benjamin Franklin, of all people. Benjamin Franklin, that go-getter, um, politician, inventor, sort of uh, renaissance genius dude of the um, colonies and early United States. Uh, there's much to criticize this guy about. But one thing that you cannot put past him is he was had this keen awareness of his place in history. This keen awareness that he was going to be um, remembered and wanted to have influence over how this was going to be. And so it's not just for like, you know, uh, armchair scientific reasons that he invented the glass harmonica, I believe. I really think that he wanted to have to his name um, this distinction of being the first American to introduce a brand new instrument into the world. And what it is, if you haven't seen one, you should Google a picture. It's wild. Um, essentially picture a box on a stand, 
and they like a long rectangular box on a stand and inside it are concentric cones of glass um, you know picture like bowls going from large on the left to small on the right and you press a pedal and this spins the glass and in the box is water which wets the glass and then you put your fingers gently on the glass and you get that ghostly hum like when you've seen somebody play wine glasses or something like that as some sort of a party trick there are a few pieces of music written for the glass harmonica and um it's R monica not har monica there are a few songs of a few pieces of like mostly like classical music once in a while you'll hear it played once in a while you'll hear it as part of a of a song these days but one reason it never caught on was man the manufacture is ridiculous you've got to get those things tuned correctly from the get-go you're never going to retune this and it's fragile like you can't move it around very much without getting you know cracks or breaks and when it breaks uh, you got to replace it with another one that again another cone that's perfectly tuned um it's interesting that the original glass harmonica which is um you know without a doubt a piece of american cultural history was floating around in the franklin estate for generations and you know the great grandkids of ben franklin had a swell time bursting each glass ring for fun and i find that really depressing and of course you know they didn't know any better whatever but okay but there are plenty that still exist and still you know sure you can hear how it sounds online now the other instrument is one that uh you probably can guess and um i generally in a class if i'm talking about music i try to get students to guess it and we get a bunch of wild guesses that i find sometimes irritating like somebody will say guitar and i'm like oh dude 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 um no and, or they'll be like saxophone and i'm like mm, 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 no um it's frustrating uh to me because it's so obvious once you hear the banjo now what i really dig about the banjo as an american invented instrument is it's the opposite of the glass harmonica just the polar opposite it was not invented by a statesman a founding father it was invented by slaves and it is not an exacting sort of science that you have to apply to put it together the original banjos could be made out of just about anything you know we've settled on a drum head and a fretboard and a uh, string strung across it um, this is a type of zither essentially which is a, a fretted stringed instrument with a sounding box of some sort um, like a guitar but the banjo is particular in that it doesn't sustain the same way as most resonator instruments um, instead uh, it has a very plucky sound that is amplified but not necessarily sustained by the resonator a percussive sort of sound if you will um, but initially they could have been made by boxes uh, turtle shells um, anything that uh, you could stretch um, essentially something over that would uh, then vibrate with the strings loudly but not in a sustained way and the drum head works perfectly so with this percussive sort of short um, length of notes it becomes a very plucky instrument you want to pluck it a lot to keep the sound going and um, it was obviously you know um, not something that was brought over by slaves it was something that was um, uh, invented here as a way to maintain you know some of their the uh, initial culture they came over with which 
you know, in the different regions of development of music, um, uh, in the continent of Africa, uh, music is very rhythmic. It's uh, very um, participatory. And in many dialects, there's no separate word for music or dance, um, which can come to a surprise if you're in college and you take an African music class and you find yourself dancing around, um, feeling every inch of your awkward whiteness. And the banjo's um, wildly versatile, gorgeous instrument can be used in so many different ways. And it is just the quintessential folk instrument. Like, it's the folk instrument for the United States the way the mandolin was for, um, you know, Italy. And it's got a, such a reach that um, if you have a banjo playing in almost any song, it sounds American. That music sounds American. So this is really interesting, right? You have one instrument that's made by the rich statesmen. You have another one made by literally enslaved people. And they both came around about the same time. And they are um, both have completely lopsided representation now. Whereas you're never going to hear a glass harmonica very much. You can catch a banjo in just about any genre of music these days. Um, from musicals to, uh, you know, rock, country, obviously, bluegrass, hip-hop. Um, it just pops up. And this really sets the tone for the development of music in the United States. And what I mean by that is that it um, has a drive behind it that is multicultural and generally the voice of the poor. The United States is a dichotomous place where you have fantastic wealth, wealthiest country of all time, and a fantastic disparity in how that wealth is distributed. You know, you look at the wealthiest country of all time and you might think that it would also have the um, highest standard of living. And this was actually true in the early um, stages of the United States in the uh, 1700s as the British soldiers came through New York, um, possessing town after town. They'd move into the houses, um, you know, because they were kicking Washington's ass, essentially. And they'd move into the houses, the farmhouses out there, and the soldiers were continually blown away at the standard of living. Like, this was wild. They, they, they couldn't imagine that regular people were, were living the way that these folks did. And um, obviously, we still had, again, that disparity even back then, um, but the distribution was a little different. And this continued all the way through the, you know, until the Industrial Revolution and then World War II, and then we really get a nice divide in incomes and wealth. Um, since World War II, that mirrors the development of popular culture, strangely enough. Okay, so let's... Jump back. Uh, I think it's really funny when you hear people say something like, oh, I think that they're a great musician. I just wish they'd keep their politics out of music. I wish they would just play and not tell us what they think. And a good example of this was um, in uh, 2003 when um, the uh, Dixie Chicks were performing in England and uh, in this performance, they announced that they were from Texas and that they were ashamed to be from the same state as our current sitting president. And this was during the, you know, second Gulf War and um, all of that. And there was this huge, like, uprising um, in conservative America about, like, how wrong this was for them to express shame over our president while in another country. Oh, my God. And as if this was the first time that musicians have ever, you know, protested the way things are. This is the norm, dude. This is the normal thing. Popular music is a roadmap of protest. And it's insane that some people think that this should just be some sort of um, artistry void of commentary. 
I mean, this is, you know, not just American. You go back to um, the development of Western music as a whole. You had protests coming through operas. You had, I mean, in during the Renaissance, there were certain um, uh, intervals that were outlawed because they were so dissonant. They were seen as the devil's music. And composers loved nothing more than sneaking those intervals into songs that would be sung in church. So they were always giving voice to counterculture in music. This is one of the very big drives of counterculture. This is one of the ways that people have been sending messages to each other about um, changing the world through music. So never listen to that. You know, never listen to this idea that it's supposed to be like somehow American propaganda of some sort. And if the music you're listening to sounds like American propaganda, I'm going to go ahead and say it probably doesn't sound as good as some other music out there. And that's okay. So we have this development of music that is coming through the country where, um, you know, on the one side you have the, the statesman, this idea of, you know, really proper, uh, classical music. I mean, during the colonies, you still, you know, Mozart was running around when the revolution happened and, um, you had, uh, on the other hand, um, slave music and, uh, this became very popular. You had kids who were raised by their, by the slaves in their household in the South. And they spent more time with the slaves than they did their parents because their parents are busy and important and, and whatnot. And eventually, don't worry, they'll, they'll learn. Um, eventually, they'll learn their place, these, these rich white kids, and um, learn how to oppress the very people who raised them. But they also were just fascinated with the storytelling and music and the way that those things were um, uh, interacting. And lots of the early you know, um, African spirituals that, um, came across and were sort of translated into American, uh, slave spirituals are protest songs. Uh, it's really in the 19th century, in the 1800s, when there becomes a musical movement that is free of the, um, constraints that, um, that normal musical performance has on it. And, and that is to say that, you know, going way back, if you're going to see a, a, a group play, um, the, chances are you were wa- watching in a church or um, some sort of a concert hall. And this is, you know, 80 people or whatever playing together. Um, and if they're like traveling musicians by any chance, there's a whole lot of them. And there's always been, you know, the troubadour and the, the, the sort of like lonely traveling musicians. But it really picks up steam in the 1800s, um, uh, post civil war, there becomes this phenomenon called the minstrel show. And the minstrel show is a, um, terribly racist phenomenon where white people wanted to see how the, um, uh, black folk did their music. And you had people traveling around the country in, um, you know, caricatures and blackface, playing banjos and singing songs and telling jokes is vaudevillian, really, and uh, supposed to be very much in the, um, you know, give you a taste of this culture. So it was making fun of it a lot, you know, um, impressing the superiority of, of white culture a lot, but also spreading the banjo, spreading this around. And um, as a uh, Western offshoot of the minstrel show was the medicine show and the medicine show was in towns that did not have a lot going for them boom towns that didn't have a lot of culture happening you'd have some snake oil salesman come into town with some sort of medicine that's supposed to be a cure-all and he'd give his little speech and they would have performers come out and play to grab attention they'd set up a little stage and they'd they'd play music and then they you know here's your hair restoration um uh, snake oil that's supposed to also add years to your life and cure your cough, et cetera, et cetera. And listen, people bought this stuff not because they really thought this medicine was going to heal them. Like, honestly. Uh, yeah, sure, maybe a minority of people did, but that was really the conceit was 
that you're selling this medicine. But when it comes down to it, they were selling entertainment. And people knew this. And buying the medicine kept the show going and gave you a souvenir. Because clearly you weren't going to be buying the CD when the musicians came around. So this was a way of marking that. This was a way of participating in that movement. And the medicine shows were... um, you know, very much influenced by minstrel shows and somewhat sometimes were just minstrel shows. But you also had more black performers in the medicine shows, uh, which did not exclude them, honestly, from the minstrel shows. You, you, there are incidences of, um, you know, uh, black performers dressed up in blackface to act like a white person acting like a black person um, because there were amazing performers who wouldn't have been allowed in the same room as the white audience. And... Um, You know, obviously this was a very dangerous line of work. So the medicine shows spread around a type of music um, that was popularized. It's called um, the cakewalk, and that turned into ragtime. And this was, both of these were um, African-American sound inventions. And you've probably heard ragtime. If not, you know, listen to The Entertainer by Scott Joplin. That's a late ragtime piano piece. It's like, listen to it with new ears. Like, give yourself the idea that no, you've never heard this before and listen to it. And what a delight. What an amazing piece of music. Um, Scott Joplin was fantastic. But really, the, the guy who was credited with so much of the movement at the time was, um, was this dude, Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster wrote songs like Camp Town Ladies, like stuff you've heard for sure. And the whole thing with Stephen Foster was, uh, he, his whole story was that he was raised by slaves and was like, um, you know, influenced by their music and, and spreading it around. There's this terribly racist statue of Stephen Foster that exists where he's sitting up high, looking out into the distance, um, uh, writing music, and he's being given like this other type of music uh, from down below by these slaves it's terrifying because really this was appropriation you know when it comes down to it this was very much appropriation you had a white guy who was composing um uh, cakewalk and and ragtime tunes that became very very popular um and this was because white america wanted this music but because of stodgy conservatism most of them were not allowed to um, listen to this music because it's, you know, black music. So Stephen Foster became the great white hype of this um, genre. Uh, as we get the turn of the 20th century, you have, again, this dichotomy still exists between the classical and the folk uh, musical movements. And I just want to present this to you as evidence as to how bad uh, this disparity can be. John Philip Sousa's marching music was the most popular thing out there. John Philip Sousa's marching music, and I'd like, just God, go listen to it. It's dreadful, you know. Um, I know that you know these songs, too. And this is what, you know, polite American society was into, was this John Philip Sousa music. And then you have Ragtime. And Ragtime is clipping along, doing really well at this time. Again, listen to Scott Joplin, and you'll get the idea of how amazing uh, it could be. And then, uh, as the development kept going, there became this style of music, Dixieland. And Dixieland, as per the name, comes from the South, um, mainly originated in, in New Orleans, where you have a a really great confluence of cultures happening, lots of influences happening. Um, And uh, the Cajun music called Zydeco was um, mixed with um, influences of ragtime, was mixed with influences of John Philip Sousa, one of the performers, one of the guys who was in John Philip Sousa's orchestra, was Louis Armstrong. And um, Dixieland became popular Dixieland was an exciting kind of like move your feet type music, which is, you know, John Philip Sousa's um, general uh, cadence is 120 beats per minute. It's very fast. See, it's really fast. And people dug that. But Dixieland took this and made it more um, exciting, less organized. Um, has banjos, 
along with some of those Susan instruments like um, the uh, the sousaphone um, and the uh, you know uh, trombones and all this stuff, trumpet obviously, and this led us to jazz. And jazz, when jazz hits, it's just again like wildly popular. You know, um, jazz has its roots in in several different regions. Of course, we have New Orleans, we have Memphis, and um, also uh, it really matures in uh, New York. There's a Chicago jazz too. Um, all of these cities like to claim founding of jazz. Most likely, you should really give it to uh, New Orleans. Here, here's the tricky thing about saying where and when and who invented a musical genre. Most people don't recognize something new until years after it happens. Most people can hear something new and write it off as like weird until it catches on enough with enough weird people that it becomes formful in, in its own thing. So the jazz revolution really, really hit in the clubs in New York, which was the cultural center of the United States at the time. And people, again, loved this. This is a black music that people love. And uh, the money's in the white folk. Recording is a thing. Um, you can actually hear Scott Joplin play music uh, from early um, records. Uh, and this music really catches on, but again, stodgy conservative societies like my kids aren't listening to black music. Uh, and this is a theme, man. This is the theme of um, the United States uh, musical heritage. I'm sure you can track it from here, right? Jazz gets really big, and then it's popularized with um, Polite Society by George Gershwin. White dude, uh, he and his brother wrote um, musicals, stage plays. And the uh, they really um, were great. And in 1924, George Gershwin de debuted um, Rhapsody in Blue. And Rhapsody in Blue was a jazz piece, a jazz piece written for an orchestra. Big band jazz. This merged um, orchestral music with jazz in a way that hadn't been done before. And essentially, this is Stephen Foster all over again in some ways, right? It's, it's an appropriation. And it's a gorgeous piece of music. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, it moved uh, jazz from the clubs to the concert halls which was a major contribution. This is the 1920s. Some people are forward thinking. This brought um, real jazz performers out of the woodwork because it was like this sort of stamp of approval that like, okay, okay, now it's okay to listen to jazz, right? And this, you know, we have Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, a lot of the, the early performers uh, who had been playing all along suddenly get popular. They suddenly get contracts. They suddenly get um, signed. Because nobody wants to miss out on this cash cow, you know? Nobody wants to miss out, and it's, uh, you know, the record companies don't. So this pattern continues and continues. Jazz eventually, um, you know, merges with another type of um, uh, music that was being heard in um, black uh, churches and spirituals, soul music, um, to be the, the blues. Um, blues get a really complex rhythms applied to it, which becomes um, R&B, rhythm and blues. And finally, one day, somebody puts a rock and roll beat to a, an R&B song. And this is generally credited to this dude named Professor Longhair, who's a uh, black performer. And if you listen to his music, it doesn't sound like rock and roll to you or me, I swear. Um, but that is the origins of really putting this new sort of beat and applying it to a music that that was, um, you know, in existence. And there's other people. Ike Turner likes to claim um, invention of rock and roll, and um, uh, Little Richard likes to claim invention. And they were there for sure. I don't feel like crediting Ike Turner with shit because he beat his wife, but, you know, that's, that happens. And um, people get all kinds of credit when they're... Um, musically inclined and not really a good person it happens so rock and roll you know they're looking for uh record companies are like they get it now they've seen this pattern before and they go rock and roll sounds great what can we do 
to get um, a big uh, white dude to, to do this. So they find this gospel singer, this gospel singer who has a deep, rich, sultry voice, who is white, Elvis Presley. They dress up Elvis Presley as a rock and roll artist, and, um, and he does the thing, man. He does the thing. Again, we have a sort of appropriation um, which opens the doors for the originators to really make it bigger um, for what that's worth. And Elvis is great. Like, he's a great performer. You can't take much away from Elvis. He never wrote any of his... He wrote one song, you know. But as a performer, the dude was great. Amazing. Um, then England gets in on the, on the rock and roll shtick. And uh, the British invasion happens, which is um, glorious and amazing. And the Beatles are glorious and amazing. And um, really, uh, what I what I want to like bring up here is that the '60s and rock and roll again. This is rich with protest music when it comes down to it. You know, from the very beginning, uh, these are working class people who are who are doing these performances, who are playing this music. These are not. Um, rich and famous people until the music makes them so. The Beatles were working class people from a dirty little mining town in England. And they kept their wits about them. They knew that they were not members of that polite, rich society that um, was inviting them in. They knew they weren't. And their music, again, communicates um, this protest um, against violence, against power, against... Um, all these things in the name of, you know, love. Wonderful shit. So rock and roll still is going on today. Rock and roll keeps going. Um, we get uh, in the 70s rap. Same thing happens with rap, right? Starts out in uh, the New York's um, uh, urban areas uh, where people who did not, were not wealthy enough to grow up with instruments, improvised their own instruments, including record scratching, which becomes its own sort of musical genre. Um, it can be done so well, and uh, rap combines, you know, rhythm and uh, words and singing into something, you know, quite new, and we can get into some of the intricacies of this a little bit later. And uh, throughout the 80s, rap gets bigger. And again, if you were there like I was, you remember plenty of people being like, oh, this is black music, you know, as if their, you know, precious rock and roll weren't somehow. And um, this, you know, eventually uh, evolves into uh, what we see as hip hop. And hip hop is, is still the knife blade of music today. It's the, the, the very tip of the sword of what is change of what is the evolution of music. Now, evolution is an important thing. When you look at each one of these genres as they emerge on the scene, evolution is important. And again, we'll get into that later. Um, uh, and I just want to mention again that rap had its great white hype, um, Vanilla Ice, oh my God, in the early 90s. Oh my God. Vanilla Ice was, was, was MC Hammer, but white. And he really went to prove that record companies had no idea what they were doing. The record companies were just, they had no idea, man. They had no idea. They were looking for a guy at, to make into a rapper, and they did it, and they just like, I mean, this guy went from like selling out stadiums to not being able to book a gig at Knott's Berry Farm within a few weeks. And part of that reason is because um, record companies had no idea that it was going to get out that this guy was fake. And they had no idea that rap... And hip-hop culture were all about what's real. They're all about the downtrodden, all about people making something out of nothing. And that Vanilla Ice does not fit that narrative. So record companies are scared off now. They don't want another Vanilla Ice. They want to stay away from it. And it takes a, um, a black uh, record label um, run by, by Dr. Dre to really recognize um, a, a, a white rapper who was good um, eventually in the 90s, and this is um, Eminem. And yes, he was another sort of great white hype, except for the fact that he was actually talented and great and that um, it took someone who was really a musician to discover him, right? Somebody who was really there. 
And this is something that's so important that the world of music is split between art and commerce, art and commerce. These things don't always match. For the most part, it is not musicians running the music industry. And that is something to really press on here, that the evolution of American music, as it comes from not only slaves, but working class, and uh, it becomes the voice of the underdog, the voice of the people instead of the government, the voice of the people instead of the wealthy. And so that's what American music is. And yet it's packaged and sold by the wealthy. It's packaged and sold by these companies that recognize someone they can make money from. And they make a lot of money, give a little bit back. So this just kind of gives you a brief rundown for why we talk about this, how we're going to get started, how popular culture um, is uh, guided and affected by all of this. And um, I don't know. It's fun for me to talk about. It's a blast.